So here I am, Matterhorn, Matterhorn moment three, knowing that we need to go to the long term and what to do. So this was Matterhorn uh, moment three. We couldn't find a match. There were very poor matches, but the risk was too high. Right? Transplants can kill you. And those matches were not of a degree that I needed, uh, that, uh, that were not sufficient, and the risk-reward ratio was too high. So what did we do? Um, uh, we just changed the definition. <laughs> we widened the criteria. So we went global in the search for a donor. We lowered kind of the HLA requirements to kind of a risk tolerant um, position. We lowered the ABA requirements and we found a match in Germany. Um, and we um, kind of measured the risks and got educated. So, um, you know, today I stand in front of you and whereas I have a heart of an American, maybe a soul of a Canadian, my blood is German. And uh, we, uh, <laughs> and picture on the right uh, is not my donor. I haven't met my donor yet. We'll meet my donor uh, at year one. But that's what, a, that's what a bone marrow transplant looks like. Some great Samaritan laid on a slab for two days and got two big drill holes in the back of their pelvis and a needle down into their thighs in their bone and they extracted bone marrow. That bone marrow went into a bag, went on a Lufthansa flight, landed in Washington, D.C. There's the actual helicopter carrying my blood, and there's the actual bag uh, that came from Germany. So that's my bone marrow transplant right there in the back. I took a picture of it. Um, now, there are 33 possible killers. And this isn't from a doctor. This is from Mark and his research. There are 33 possible killers from a bone marrow transplant. There's no handbook, I'm gonna write one, but there are 33 possible killers. And on the bottom is sort of days, right? As the days go on, your killers kind of get diminished uh, through a stem cell transplant. And I'll come back to this uh, here in a moment. Now, I'm an innovator, I'm an engineer, I'm an old computer programmer. So, and kind of those, you know, you know when I'm not working, um, here's every drug I took through this journey. Every, every drug on the right uh, got injected into me at some point. Serolimus, um, uh, um, uh, Idarubin, Nuprogen, Vidaza, um, Celsep, Bactrim, um, um, uh, Vfend, Hydra, Serafinib, slash AC220, which is a different drug. And um, I try to find the origin of every one, right? Just kind of my intellectual curiosity. And I'll pick out a few. Um, serolimus is after your transplant, you try, to, you try to suppress your immune system a little bit. And um, some scientist found a fungus on Easter Island and turned it into a drug. And so the drug name is actually called Rapa Nui. Um, um, uh, the clinical name is called Rapa Nui. The manufacturing name of it is Serolimus. But it's a fungus only found on Easter Island, and I found that fascinating. Um, and it's a lot of innovation, right, that kind of goes into these medicines. Uh, ARC, uh, ARC, or ARC-C, as it's, as it's called, is from a coral reef. They take corals, and they grind them up, um, they add a, a little chemical to them, and that's one of the leading cancer drugs, if you will, but it comes from a coral reef. Um, VFEND, I don't know if everyone's been on VFEND, but VFEND is an antifungal. And when you lose your immune system, they're just pumping you with stuff. And by the way, I never got sick from not having an immune system. It, it's just amazing. I lost my immune system five or six times, and I never got sick, never got sick, um, which was just um, unusual, but very blessed for that. But this drug is an hallucinogenic drug. Gordon, can I say as a CEO I took an hallucinogenic drug? <laughs> Gordon's going, no, don't say it. So um, VFEND actually can um, um, make your dream waves work different. And I was only on it for like a couple days, Gordon. Um, but for me, th this VFEND, it was like watching every movie I've ever watched, fast forward it in 10 minutes, and I appear in the scenes. And, and it was just one of the most amazing experiences uh, that I've ever had. <laughs>
This isn't being recorded, is it, Gordon? So um, my point being, know your drugs. Be your advocate. And you can also have a little fun with them as well. And I try to research where all these things, all these things came from. So big four phases to the transplant. I won't go through them all. I'm running a little late. Uh, I've been through the transplant. I'm on the tail end of this. Um, but at the end of it, you come out with a baby immune system, right? So I have a whole new immune system. Um, and it's like being a, uh, I'm a 50-year-old with a two-year immune system. And um, early next year, uh, I'll need to get revaccinated, right? I I'm no longer vaccinated, right? I killed my bone marrow. I killed my blood production. I've taken a donor. Um, it's fully engrafted. And um, I now have a baby immune system. But it, t it wipes out all your inoculations. So chicken pop, chicken pox, measles, mumps, all those things, I'm uh, no longer vaccinated for. So uh, next year, um, probably around February, I go back in and I get revaccinated. And um, that hopefully will be um, kind of the last step here is just getting my vaccinations back. Um, this is how a bone marrow transplant actually gets injected. I'm kidding. Um, how many people have been watching the Nick? Isn't it, I like the Nick, right? It's a little grotesque, but it's you know it's it's a hospital in like 1910 in New York City, and this is Clive Owen. So I'm just having a joke with you here. Right, this isn't how it actually happens, but I love the series The Nick, and if you haven't seen it, go watch it. It's just a lot of fun. So this is not how a transplant happens. Maybe this is how it happened in 1910. Here's how it happens. So it's just interjected intravenously. And so that bag of blood um, gets injected. And magically, and doctors still don't know how, that progenitor cell, so that blood is actually not blood. It's blood-like. Uh, it's bone marrow. And it just magically finds its way uh, into where it needs to go and attaches. And then it either engrafts or it doesn't. Um, the transplant can kill you. You've got about a 15% chance you don't come out of it. Uh, me on the right there um, is after the transplant. Uh, I had a 10 to 15 minute reaction that was hypothermia-like um, with great kind of shivers, if you will, in a very cold body. And they wheeled in this oven that had blankets in it. And um, all they could do was just keep putting warm blankets on you. And I can still feel the warmth of those blankets today. Uh, but 10 minutes later, they took the blankets off, and I was fine. But there's me uh, right after the transplant uh, with those oven-banked uh, 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 blankets on top of them.